Backbone is an independently published comic book series, written and illustrated by Jeff Smith, originally serialized in 55 irregularly released issues from 1991 to 2004. Smith's black and white drawings were inspired by animated cartoons and comic strips, a notable influence being Walt Kelly's Pogo, I Was. A big fan of Karl Barth's and Pogo, so it was just natural for me to want to draw that kind of mixture of Walt Kelly and Moebius. Accordingly, the story is singularly characterized by a combination of both light-hearted comedy and dark, epic fantasy. Time magazine has called the series as sweeping as the Lord of the Rings cycle, but much funnier. The series was published bi-monthly with some delays from June 1991 to June 2004. The series was self-published by Smith's Cartoon Books for issues number 1 through number 19, by Image Comics from issues number 20 to number 28, and back to Cartoon Books for issues number 29 through number 55. Bone has received numerous awards, among them 10 Eisner Awards and 11 Harvey Awards. Story The series centers on the Bone Cousins, white, bald cartoon caricatures. In the opening pages of Out from Bonneville the three bone cousins are Euro Avish responsible P. Phony Bone, Goofy Cigar Smoking Smiley Bone, and Everyman character Phone Bone Your Euro have been run out of their hometown of Bonneville after Phony's campaign for mayor went awry. After crossing a desert, the cousins are separated by a sea of locusts and individually ending up in the mysterious valley and must make their way across the fantasy landscape pursued by rat creatures. They joyously reunite at a local tavern called Barrel Haven, where they are taken in by a mysterious girl named Thorn and her even more enigmatic grandmother. Phone Bone instantly develops a crush on Thorn when he meets her, and repeatedly attempts to express his love through poetry. As they stay longer in the valley, they encounter humans and other creatures who are threatened by a dark entity, the Lord of the Locusts. The bones are quickly drawn into the events around them compelling them on a hero's journey to help free the valley. Although Bonneville is never actually shown in the story, it is implied as technologically contemporary, Phone refers to its extensive downtown and his comics for Smiley and a novel of Moby Dick in his pack, Phony carries dollar bills, and Smiley refers to a pizza in a Cooper scent and a corn dog hooter scent. In contrast, the valley is depicted as somewhat medieval, inasmuch as its citizens employ a bartering system, weapons and modes of transportation similar to those of the Middle Ages, and Phony persistently refers to the valley people as yokels. Publication History According to Jeff Smith, the earliest forerunner drawings of what later became Bone and his cousins occurred when he was about five, and sitting in his living room drawing, and he drew what looked like an old C-shaped telephone handset receiver, which emerged as a frowning character with its mouth wide open. Elements of that character and its demeanor found their way into the character Phony Bone, the upset cousin to Bone. His name is derived from Phone Bone, the generic surname that Don Martin gave to many of the characters that appeared in his Mad Magazine strips. Smith began to create comics with the Bone characters as early as 1970, when he was about 10 years old. A major influence on Smith was Scrooge McDuck creator Carl Barks. Alluding to Barks influence on Bone, Smith commented, I always wanted Uncle Scrooge to go on a longer adventure. I thought, man, if you could just get a comic book of that quality, the length of say, War and Peace, or The Odyssey or something, that would be something I would love to read, and even as a kid I looked everywhere for that book, that Uncle Scrooge story that was 1,100 pages long. Another influence on Bone, and Smith's biggest influence in writing comics in general, however, is Walt Kelly. Specific literary works that influenced Bone include Smith's favorite book, Moby Dick. Smith, who cites its multi-layered narrative and symbolism, placed numerous references to it in Bone. He has also cited Huckleberry Finn as a story after which he attempted to pattern Bone structurally, explaining, the kinds of stories the Euro unregistered trademark M drawn to, like Huckleberry Finn, are the ones that start off very simple almost like children a Euro unregistered trademark s stories. But as it goes on, it gets a little darker, and the themes become a little more sophisticated and more complex a Euro, and those are really the kinds of stories that just get me going. Other influences in this regard include the original Star Wars trilogy, 
J. R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings and the classic fairy tales and mythologies that inspired those works. While Smith attended The Ohio State University, he created a comic strip called Thorn for the student newspaper, The Lantern, which included some of the characters who later featured in The Bone. After college, Smith and his friends produced animation work on commission in their studio, Character Builders Incorporated, but Smith eventually came to decide that it was not the type of cartooning he wished to do. Drawn to the idea that he could produce his own animated type story but in the comics medium, and convinced by Frank Miller's The Dark Knight Returns and Art Spiegelman's Moss that a serious comic book with a beginning, middle and end structure was both artistically and commercially viable, Smith decided to produce Bone. In 1991, Smith launched his company, Cartoon Books, to publish the series. Initially, Smith self-published the book, which meant that he did all the work required to both produce and distribute the series as a business himself including answering letters, doing all the graphics and lettering, sending the artwork to the printer, handling orders and bookkeeping. This made it difficult to focus on writing and drawing the book, and as a result, he fell behind in his production. To remedy this, he asked his wife, Vijaya, to quit her lucrative job at a Silicon Valley startup company in order to run the business side of Bone as the president of Cartoon Books. As a result, Smith was able to refocus on drawing, and sales improved. In 1995, Smith began publishing Bone through Image Comics. Smith believed this would be a temporary arrangement, and to maintain the book's place in catalogs, the collected volumes remained under the Cartoon Books label. During the title's time at Image, the first 27 issues were reprinted by Image with new covers, which are distinguished by the Image logo in the upper left hand corner of the cover. The cartoon book's printings have black back covers, inset with a single panel reprinted from inside. First printings can be distinguished from later printings by changes in the color of the logo on the front cover. The comic and its story ended with its 55th issue, dated June 2004. The back cover has, in place of the usual comic panel, a black and white photo of Smith in his studio drawing the last page on May 10. In an interview on Attack of the Show, Smith revealed that he drew the last page before working on the first issue. The 55 issues have been collected into the following volumes. Equals individual volumes equals, other books published in the color series but not part of the main storyline are the prequel Rose, illustrated by Charles Vess. The Bone Hand Book. And Tall Tales, which has a new story surrounding reprints of the Big Johnson Bone story, the Disney Adventure story, and a few new tales. Issues from the Out from Bonneville collection were also reprinted in the digest-sized children's magazine Disney Adventures, first in 1994 and later in 1997 through 1998. The issues usually consisted of seven a year or nine pages a month and were colored. The pages were also censored to remove smoking and drinking references and any innuendo involving thorn and phone bone. There was also an exclusive story for Disney Adventures by Smith, featuring Phone and Phony following a treasure map. The series was split into three story arcs, each having two names, one being the original arc name, the other being the name used in the one-volume edition, respectively as follows. The first arc lasted from issues number 1-20 being named Vernal Equinox, or The Valley. It was the longest-running arc running for four years and one month. The main story in issue 13.5, Up on the Roof, was reprinted as Chapter 6 in the The Great Cow Race Collected Edition, therefore making it part of Vernal Equinox. The second arc was named Solstice, or Phony Strikes Back. The arc lasted from issues number 21-39. It is tied as the longest-running arc in issues with the third arc. The third arc, Harvest or Friends and Enemies, lasted from issues number 40-58. Equals Color Editions equals from February 2005 to January 2009, Scholastic Incorporated began reissuing in both hardcover and paperback the individual volumes in full color by Steve Hamaker. In 2006, HarperCollins began publishing the full color editions for the UK market. In the color editions, the following changes were made these editions correct some spelling errors, such as Cupidol for Cupidol, and Kowtow for Kowtow. 
some lines of dialogue were completely rewritten for these versions, and some story pages were added and others removed. One example of new material in Eyes of the Storm is Thorn and Phone in the Garden talking about ghost circles. Four pages were excluded from the conversation between Thorn, Granma and Phone in the Dragon Slayer. In Rock Jaw, the two rat creatures talk about ghost circles as well, which did not happen in the original issues in black and white paperbacks. Much of the dialogue on the remaining pages was edited as well, replaced with shorter lines. In the same book, the frames from the last pages were completely rearranged, and some of the original ones were removed. Similar additions were made as well to Old Man's Cave, Ghost Circles and Treasure Hunters. The series was also reprinted in color under HarperCollins Children's Books, the fourth individual reprinting for the first three volumes and the third individual reprinting for the last six volumes. The first three volumes have been published in 2005, 2007, and 2009, respectively, though it is unclear whether the last six volumes will be reprinted. Equals one volume edition equals. The special 1332 page, one volume edition was released originally for $40 through Jeff Smith's cartoon books imprint in a paperback volume. This special print of the entire adventure was to celebrate the recent end of the series and the commencement of every collection in the series being reprinted in color through Scholastic Press. First released in 2004 and promoted as only a limited print run being available, this edition has had several reprintings to keep it available. In addition to the one-volume paperback, a signed limited edition hardcover edition of the one-volume book was issued. The deluxe hardcover featured gold embossed lettering on the cover, gilded edges, and a cloth ribbon bookmark. The end pages are printed with a map of the valley and it comes with a full color signed and numbered book plate. This limited edition pressing of the book originally sold for around $125 and was initially limited to 2,000 copies. The series has been reprinted 13 times also featuring a signed limited edition of the 13th pressing version sold during November 2009. The collection won the 2005 Eisner Award for Best Graphic Album Reprint, and was listed at number 3 in Time Magazine's Best Comics of 2004. Reviewer Andrew Arnold said of the collection, which was published at the conclusion of the monthly series, as sweeping as the Lord of the Rings cycle, but much funnier. Smith imbues even simple dialogue panels with animation. Now that it's finished Bone should join the ranks of Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter and the young adult pantheon. Equals full color one volume edition equals, in November 2011, for its 20th anniversary, a full color one volume edition was released. It has a special section in the back with a cover gallery of the original comics, an illustrated timeline of Bone's 20-year history and an essay by author Jeff Smith. A special edition was also released that included the book, a signed print by Jeff Smith, a phony bone gold coin, three pewter bone figures of phone bone, phony bone and smiley bone, a copy of the cartoonist documentary DVD, a miniature facsimile of the original bone comic number one and a big red box with a picture of phone on it to hold it all. Spin-offs and special one-shots. Equals spin-offs equals both prequels and sequels to the main storyline. Thorn, Tales from the Lantern, during college, Jeff Smith produced a series of comic strips that serve as a beta version of the Bone series, though with the Bone cousins Phone and Phony as supporting cast members and Thorn as the main character. The strips correspond with the first 28 issues of the Bone series, and was collected as a trade paperback after Smith graduated in 1989. It sold nearly a thousand copies and is currently out of print. It can still be found for sale online however. Rose, Stupid, Stupid Rat Tales, The Adventures of Big Johnson Bone, Frontier Hero, Bone, Tall Tales, The Events Show Smiley and Bartleby after the events in the main series. It features them telling tall tales to three Bone brothers. It is a repackaging of Stupid, Stupid Rat Tales, including a Disney Adventures short and new material. It was released on August 1, 2010. This spin-off mainly focuses on Big Johnson Bone's adventures, some time before the cousins' adventures in the valley, though there is one short with Phone and Phony follow a treasure map, which is later revealed as a joke by Thorn, 
who wanted the two to do the laundry. One story with Big Johnson Bone depicts his discovery of the valley with his monkey, Pip. In Bone Volume 7, Ghost Circles, Bartleby mentions that before rat creatures had long, beautiful, hairless tails, which have to be cut off when the rat creature reaches one year of age, out of fear that they will dragged away by their tails by a monster named Jack. In Tall Tales, the Jack is revealed to be Big Johnson Bone, who swung them around by their tails when they attacked him, and due to this they decided to cut their tails so they could never be used against them again. In this, the royal rat creatures grow to be quite large, possibly explaining King Duck, the rat creature ruler, to be of such great size comparatively to the other rat creatures. The Red Dragon also appears in the story. Bone Handbook is a 128-page handbook that chronicles the series and is accompanied by sketches, interviews, etc. The book was released in February 2010. Bone, Legacy, a trilogy of illustrated prose novels, written by Tom Snegoski, following the adventures of new bones in their quest in the valley. The first volume, Quest for the Spark, was released on February 1, 2011. A few of the characters from the original series are in the story, such as the two stupid rat creatures and Roderick the Raccoon, from the fifth trade paperback collection, Rock Jaw, Master of the Eastern Border. Thorn Harbstar and Grandma Ben are also in the trilogy. And in the book, the Bone Cousins are mentioned in passing, though have no major part in the volume. Part 2 Quest for the Spark was released on February 1, 2012. The story continues from Part 1 against the Nact, a dark creature that puts nearly everyone in the valley to sleep. Part 3 was released on February 1, 2013. Equals Special One Shots equals Bone, Holiday Special, 1993, Warrior Publications, 14 pages, this was a Hero Premier Edition bundled with Hero Illustrated magazine. It includes a short story where the Bone Cousins celebrate winter solstice, and also a Jeff Smith interview and sketches. It is featured in the Crown of Horns collection and the final issue of the series. Bone No. 13 or one half, January 1995, Wizard, 28 pages. This was a free comic book mail and offer through Wizard magazine. As was also common with Wizard magazine comic offers, there was a special gold foil cover variant where the bone title on the cover is embossed in gold foil. It came in a rigid Myla sleeve and a certificate of authenticity. There is a short story that fits in between number 13 and number 14 of the regular series, and is included in Bone Volume 2, The Great Cow Race. This special also includes a Jeff Smith interview and sketches. Bone Sourcebook, 1995, Image Comics. 16 pages with wraparound cover, this was a free promotional book given out at 1995 San Diego Comic Con and it also poly bagged with Wizard magazine. This source book was published to celebrate the move of the Bone series from self-publishing to Image Comics, where it stayed for only seven issues before Jeff Smith took it back to self-publishing. It includes an introduction by Jeff Smith and biography, character profiles, color poster by Jim Lee. Story timeline, upcoming storyline, and shipping schedule. Bone number no. 1 10th anniversary edition, 2001, cartoon books, to celebrate its 10 year anniversary. A special color edition of Bone number no. 1 was released with a free collectible phone bone PVC figure and a full color phony bone gazillion dollar bill. This special edition included a new cover, a new afterword by Jeff Smith and an illustrated eight-page commentary by comics historian R.C. Harvey, and the original artwork was digitally remastered in full color. Characters equals Main characters equals Phone Bone, the hero of the series, Phone Bone is the most courageous of the bones. He and his cousin Smiley Bone help their other cousin Phony Bone escape from Bunnable after he upset the villagers, and get stuck in the valley. He is passionate about his favorite book, Moby Dick, and is the most level-headed and the smartest of the three Bone Cousins. He has an unrequited crush on Thorn Harbstar. Phone Bone is very wary of his cousin Phony's schemes, and always suspects him of something. The suspicion usually turns out right, and Phone is often angered by Phony not seeming to care about the valley, as Phony constantly tries to leave to return to Bonneville. 
after the hooded one realizes Phony Bone is not the person she needs to complete her ritual to revive Mim, the Queen of the Dragons, and realizes that Thorn was too powerful for her to control, she then seeks Phone, for in Ghost Circles, Volume 7 of the series, it is revealed that Phone has the locust inside him too, which likely came from either his encounter in Rock Jaw, Master of the Eastern Border, when he is knocked off a cliff, or in Old Man's Cave, when he rescues Thorn from the locusts by putting the dragon necklace on her. It is later taken out in Ghost Circles by Thorn, who took it herself, because she was told to buy her dead mother in a ghost circle. This remains unknown by Thorn until Crown of Horns, when they try to destroy the locust by touching the sacred Crown of Horns. He saves the day by touching the Crown of Horns while holding Thorn's hand who is incapacitated on the ground, stuck in King Dirk's jaws, whom she killed. There they are given a choice to live or die, both who choose live. Thorn and Fern are both given pieces of the crown of horns as teeth which were knocked out in a fight with Tarsal's followers. The teeth apparently cause rapid healing of the two's injuries. His name is derived from Fern Bone, the recurring surname that Don Martin gave to many of the characters that appeared in his Mad Magazine strips. Wizard Magazine ranked Phone Bone as the 28th greatest comic book character of all time. IGN also ranked Phone Bone as the 60th greatest comic book hero of all time stating that his good nature and his unrequited love for his ally Thorn make Phone the heart and soul of this fantastical book. Fonsible P. Phony Bone, manipulative and greedy, Phony Bone is the least courageous of the bones and he will do anything to get rich. Run out of Bonneville by an angry mob of villagers after trying to run for mayor of Bonneville, his greediness and selfishness makes an enemy of anyone who crosses him in the valley. Referred to as the one who bears the star by the hooded one, Phony is sought after by the rat creature army though he does not know why. Phone says that part of the reason for his cousin's resourcefulness and greed may be that Phony, as the oldest of the Bone Trio, raised his two cousins when they were young, poor orphans. Though he is selfish, he is very protective of his cousins when he needs to be and shows he really cares about them. For example, when he is approached by the Hooded One who proceeds to threaten Phone Bone, Fonsible becomes angry and warns the Hooded One to stay away from Phone. He also shows his courageous side, because despite his complaints throughout the story and appearing to run away in the last battle, he comes back in armor with reinforcements ready for battle. To his dismay, they arrive right as the battle ended. However he still claims he is a hero. Smiley Bone, the tallest of the bones and arguably the least intelligent, he plays a one-string instrument resembling a lute. Smiley is often seen smoking a cigar, and often irritates characters with his simple-mindedness, even when seeking to help people, as when Lucius refers to Smiley's help as torture. He takes kindly to a rat creature cub, whom he names Bartleby, and through his nurturing of Bartleby, depth is revealed in his character. When he and his cousins were children, Phony made him steal pies off windowsills, because he was the tallest, and apparently they were poor to the point where they couldn't afford food. Phony mentions that when he became rich, Smiley made him pay everyone back. Phony Bone always employs Smiley in his scams, like in the Great Cow Race. Sometimes Smiley shows a penchant for intelligence, as when, in Bone Volume 9 Crown of Horns, he devises a plan during the Siege of Athua. The plan is to feed the two stupid rat creatures quiche, then let them go accidentally, so the rat creatures would tell their leaders that Athua could withstand the siege, under the logic that if they could feed their prisoners quiche, they presumably have enough food to feed themselves making a siege hopeless. Smiley also has his serious, sad moments, as when, at the end of the story, he mourns Lucius, and expresses sadness at leaving the valley. Equals valley characters equals, Thorn Harvestar, seemingly a simple farm girl, it is soon revealed that she is heir to the throne of Athua. She is also the Beni Yankari. Thorn has been shown to have excellent courage, as well as fantastic powers, such as escaping through a landslide blindfolded, flying, and jumping a castle wall without injuring herself. In a sense she can do anything if she can concentrate her dreaming. Phone Bone falls in love with her at their first meeting. She starts off sweet and innocent, 
yet later in Treasure Hunters when the seriousness and reality of everything dawns on her she takes on a more mature and tougher personality. Rose Grandma Ben, Thorne's grandmother, a tough-as-nails farmer who races against cows on foot as a hobby, and always wins. An immensely strong person, it is revealed that she is the former Queen of Athua who escaped to Barrel Haven with Lucius Down in order to protect and safeguard Thorne. Lucius Down, a large, gruff, older man who was described as over seven feet tall and over three hundred pounds. Lucius was so powerful he could scare even Euclid into submission. He runs the Barrel Haven Tavern, and was the foil for almost all of Phony Bone's schemes. In the later books we find that Jonathan Oakes was like a son to him. He was previously captain of the Queen's Guard and it was hinted he had a history with Grandma Ben, only to reveal later that he had picked the wrong girl, instead falling in love with her sister, Briar, whose motive in the affair was to hurt Rose. He was later in love with Rose Halfstar. Before the rat creatures destroy his tavern, he relocates to Old Man's Cave, where he becomes captain of an ill-equipped infantry of Barrel Haven farmers. After the volcano erupts, he leads the farmers in Benny Yan South, arriving in time for the battle on Sinner's Rock. When the Hooded One prepared to kill Rose, Lucius grabs onto her just as her master, the Lord of the Locust, is destroyed. The resulting surge in power incinerates Briar and kills Lucius. His body is later taken north and buried behind the rebuilt Barrel Haven Tavern. The Great Red Dragon, the son of the Great Dragon Mim, the Great Red Dragon is often Phone Bone's last minute savior. The Red Dragon appears when he is most needed. Grandma Ben does not trust him, regardless of how many times he has saved her or her friends from harm. The Great Red Dragon seems to be incredibly ancient. In a sequence that shows the land during the dragon's reign, supposedly the beginning of time, the Great Red Dragon can be seen fighting Mim along with other dragons. As said in the prequel Stupid, Stupid Rat Tales, he is Mim's son and he was part of the group that trapped her in stone when the valley was made. He took care of Thorn during the Great War while Rose searched for a place for them to hide. He is also seen at the end of Stupid, Stupid Rat Tales during the time of Bonneville's founding by Big Johnson Bone. Phone Bone indicates that he has a baritone voice. Jonathan Oakes, a small, often outspoken villager who works for Lucius at the Barrel Haven, and views Lucius as a hero. Though he was saved from an ambush from the rat creatures in Old Man's Cave, it is revealed that he died subsequently, in the Veni Yan Infirmary. Wendell, one of Lucius' tough barroom boys, and the tinsmith of Barrel Haven. Outspoken in the early issues, he became more introverted once the reality of the war presented itself. He often changes sights and his mind. He goes from hating the bones and stick eaters to following them and them hating the bones again. He seems to be a powerful ally to have in his village and is often as followed by the villagers when he changes sides. Despite his skinny appearance, he is implied to be just as strong as Euclid. Euclid, along with Jonathan and Wendell, one of the barroom boys. He is depicted as very large and muscular and often wishes to resort to physical force to solve problems. He is consumed by a ghost circle after the volcano explosion, but returns after Thorn destroys the ghost circles. Rory, a third barroom boy, is almost always present near Wendell, Euclid, and Jonathan, but rarely speaks. None of his comments give much of a hint to his personality. It is implied that he is a total follower with little or no influence. Ted, a helpful Acanalonia bivitator, or plant helper, who appears as a recurring supporting character. Often mistaken for a leaf, Ted is the first creature phone bone encounters when he enters the valley and the two become fast friends. He harbors a strange link to the Red Dragon and has an older brother who is several hundred times his size. He is able to perform magical enchantments and has the ability to detect ghost circles. Miss Possum a female opossum who is the mother to the three possum kids, she is likewise a caring, motherly figure to everyone in the valley. She often has something to give to Phone Bone when she sees him, such as sealing putty, which Phone mistakenly eats a little. The possum kids, three young opossums with a thirst for adventure. They have a knack for getting into trouble which then Phone Bone saves them, but they are resourceful and cunning. 
the possums look suspiciously like Pogo the possum from Walt Kelly's comic strip. Equals mountain creatures equals, the hooded one, servant of the Lord of the Locusts, King Dirk Superior, and the main antagonist. It is implied that the hooded one is a form of any Yan warrior, as she wears a similar robe and hood. It is later revealed that the hooded one is Briar Halfstar, the elder sister of Grandma Ben and the grand aunt of Thorn. Briar was made to feel inferior to her sister when she was younger, and when the rat creatures invaded in the Great War, she betrayed the royal family by leading them to the rat creatures. When the king, Thorn's father, learned of this betrayal, he cut her in half with an abandoned harvesting scythe, which the hooded one now carries as a weapon that can now cut through steel and rock. Briar was possessed and resurrected by a swarm of locusts. She is killed when her master, the Lord of the Locusts, is destroyed. It is suggested by some of her actions throughout the storyline that being the servant of the Lord of the Locusts drove her insane. King Duke, a giant rat creature, ruler of the horde of rat creatures and lackey of the Lord of the Locusts. Although he is egomaniacal and cruel, he is prone to superstition and easily manipulated by the Hooded One. He carries a golden spiked club around with him, until Thorn cuts off his right arm. Rockja at one point attacks King Duck and rips out his tongue, which he keeps as a trophy. A possible continuity error is that while Rockja is bragging about owning the tongue, King Duck cannot speak, but later speaks clearly to the hooded one. After that, he attempts to say kill you, and it comes out kill you, just as one would speak without a tongue. This may be an effect of the Hooded One's power. While the Hooded One is alive he can speak, but after she is destroyed he cannot. At the end of the novel, he faces Thorn before she can touch the Crown of Horns. He tells her that, either she kills him or he kills her, because he wants to die. He states that he is tired of being the Hooded One's puppet. Thorn does not want to kill him, even though he goads her by reminding her that he was the one who killed her parents. She tries to dart towards the crown of horns, but King Duck bites her leg. Given no choice, Thorn then drives her sword into King Duck, killing him. He was succeeded by King Agak. Phone bones two rat creatures, two rat creature soldiers, one blue, one brown, who have a particular interest in devouring the bone cousins, and Phone Bone in particular. The two are rather incompetent. Once deserting the army after their disobedience costs King Dirk his arm and later align with the bones briefly before returning to their own side. They address each other as comrade. Phone Bone is the one who dubs the two stupid, stupid rat creatures. In rat creature tradition only royalty are allowed to have names, but in the spin-off novel's quest for the spark two young bones gave them the names Stinky and Smelly. As it stands, the proper name of their species appears to be hairy men. Named after some incidents where one, or both, clearly emphasize their title, they in turn call phone bone small mammal. In a running gag throughout the series, the brown rat creature often suggests cooking phone bone in a quiche. The other rat creature then flies into a rage, insisting that dainty pastry foods are unfit for monsters and that they should eat him in a stew a euro though he did once in a fit of anger declare an intention of eating phone bone raw, and on another occasion, when they were starving, told his comrade that he wouldn't mind some of his homemade quiche. Later, phone bone himself delivered to the two some piping hot quiche when he found them shivering in a bush after the hooded one's defeat. They also have a major role and quest for the spark. Bartleby a purplish baby rat creature found by Phone Bone and adopted as a pet by Smiley Bone. After the Bone's first encounter with Rock Jar, Bartleby returns to the fold of the rat creatures, though is out of place there and returns to the Bones later after growing a little. He became a good friend to Smiley and when they left for Bonneville, he went with them. Bartleby was named by Shane and Kay Garrity, for the title character in the short story Bartleby, the Scrivener by Herman Melville. Unlike the other rat creatures, Bartleby has round ears. He explains that the rat creatures are supposed to get their ears cropped and that he ran away before they could do that to him. Bartleby also explains that the first time he ran away from the rat creatures was after he got his tail chopped off. He states that all rat creatures are born with beautiful, long, hairless tails, but all the rat creature cubs have their tails chopped off around the time they turn one year old. 
This is due to their belief that a sort of boogeyman named the Jack will drag them away in their sleep by their tails. In the prequel book Stupid, Stupid, Rat Tales, we learn that the Bone Cousins' forefather Big Johnson Bone is the fabled boogeyman they fear, having come to the valley hundreds of years earlier and fighting the rat creatures by swinging them around by their tails. In a sequence depicting the land during the dragon's rule, rat creatures with long tails can be seen in the distance. Rock Jar, a huge mountain lion bigger than King Duck who views himself as neutral in the conflict between the humans and the Lord of the Locusts despite lopsided affiliations. He is the guardian of the eastern border. His personal views are that there is no such thing as good and evil, only that power matters above all and that friendship and love is meaningless. He despises both dragons and rat creatures but works for the hooded one in exchange for land and spoils of war. His name is mispronounced as Rockjaw by the Bone Cousins. Roderick and the Orphans Roderick is a young raccoon whose parents were killed and eaten by the two stupid rat creatures. He is the leader of a large group of orphaned animal children living in the mountains. Roderick is the only one named, and the complete group consists of a beaver, a boar, a second raccoon, two birds, a rabbit, a porcupine, a turtle, two snakes, a squirrel, and a chipmunk. Roderick the raccoon is a main character in the quest for the spark, though he is now older and friends with Tom Elm, another main character in the trilogy. King Agak, the new rat creature King and Bone, Legacy, who replaces King Duck following the latter's death. Like King Duck, he hates the two stupid rat creatures. After the duo steal a dead squirrel from him, he becomes obsessed with revenge. Agak and his army are starving, and are convinced that they can cure their hunger by eating the bones. Equals others equals, the Lord of the Locusts, the unseen Dark Lords who orchestrates much of the saga's villainy. He is an evil, formless nightmare trapped inside a mountain, and appears in the form of a locust swarm to his chief henchman, the Hooded One. He was killed when Phone Bone and Thorn touched the crown of horns. Mim, the original Queen of the Dragons, believed to be the creator of the valley, who was possessed by the Lord of the Locusts, and turned to stone by the other dragons. Her awakening was said to be the end of the world, but when the Lord of the Locusts was destroyed, an aged Mim returned to her function followed by all of the other dragons besides the Great Red Dragon. The Veni Yan, a mysterious clan of hooded warriors. Distrusted by the townsfolk but trusted by Lucius, though often they do not trust him in return. Headmaster, the leader of the Venue and most powerful soldier. He is distinguished with a fur vest with bronze tokens. In the series, two appear. The first is the current one who has a feeling that the world is ending. The second one is retired in the city of Athua and is the headmaster that appears in Rose. Tarsal, the ruthless leader of the Beju. He has a large scar down the length of his face and claims that the scar was obtained while fighting dragons. He wears a large earring on one ear, and his beard in two separate parts each wrapped in a piece of cloth. He does not respect the monarchy of Athia claiming that the throne is dead, even when Rose and Thorn return. He is killed by Briar in front of his own people. The Veju, a separatist group of Veni Yan who are led by Tarsal. Although they wear similar hoods to the Veni Yan they are distinguishable by the eye that they wear on their hoods. The Veju do not worship, or even respect, dragons, claiming that they have all gone into hiding or are uncaring enough to ignore their people. They have kept order in Anithia for much of the time that Rose and Thorn were in exile, and claim that things are better that way. However some people disagree and continue to set out dragon shrines, which are removed by the Beju. Reception Bone had only six issues published when it was selected for Palmer's picks by Tom Palmer, Jr., who commented that Smith's artwork is deceptively simple. He doesn't use much flash, yet he is a master of conveying gesture and body language for both humorous and dramatic effect. He also noted that the series has only recently begun, yet it has been met with enormous amounts of critical praise from people ranging from Willie Sner to Peter David. Michael Arner from PopMatters.com was initially not impressed with the black and white artwork, and at first disappointed at the ending, hoping for a more conclusive dark copyright movement. However, he ultimately praised the depth of the characterizations and Smith's ability to mix humor and adventure perfectly.
Bob's Comics Review described the work as Tolkien-esque in its compulsive progression from a simple comic tale to a sprawling epic. Although critical of the earlier issues, the writer came to enjoy the range of writing from slapstick, to the scary at hilarious rap creatures, to intimations of high fantasy. Smith's sense of timing was praised as well as the creator's use of the silent panel and repeated scene with variations of movement or perspective. In 2004, Time critic Andrew Arnold called Bone the best all-ages graphic novel yet published. In 2010, a Minnesota parent sought to have Bone banned from all elementary school libraries in the Rosemount Apple Valley Egan School District, citing references in the work to smoking, drinking, and gambling. After a hearing, a school district committee voted 10 to 1 to keep the books on the shelves. Equals awards equals. 1993 Eisner Award for Best Humor Publication, 1994 Eisner Award for Best Serialized Story, The Great Cow Race. Bone No. 7th to 11th 1994 Eisner Award for Best Continuing Series, 1994 Eisner Award for Best Writer Artist, Jeff Smith, 1994 Eisner Award for Best Humor Publication, 1995 Eisner Award for Best Humor Publication, 1995 Eisner Award for Best Writer Artist, Humor Jeff Smith, 1995 Eisner Award for Best Continuing Series, 1998 Eisner Award for Best Writer Artist, Humor Jeff Smith, 2005 Eisner Award for Best Graphic Album, Reprint Bone One Volume Edition, 1994 Harvey Award for Best Cartoonist, Jeff Smith, 1994 Harvey Award Special Award for Humor, Jeff Smith, 1994 Harvey Award for Best Graphic Album of Previously Published Work, The Complete Bone Adventures. Reissued in color as Bone, out from Bonneville, 1995 Harvey Award for Best Cartoonist, Jeff Smith, 1996 Harvey Award for Best Cartoonist, Jeff Smith, 1997 Harvey Award for Best Cartoonist, Jeff Smith, 1999 Harvey Award for Best Cartoonist, Jeff Smith. For his body of work in 1998, including Bone, 2000 Harvey Award for Best Cartoonist, Jeff Smith, 2003 Harvey Award for Best Cartoonist, Jeff Smith, 2005 Harvey Award for Best Cartoonist, Jeff Smith, 2005 Harvey Award for Best Graphic Album of Previously Published. Work, Bone One Volume Edition, Nominations, 1993 Eisner Award for Best Writer Artist, Jeff Smith. 1995 Eisner Award for Best Single Issue, Bone No. 16, Eyes of the Storm, 1995 Eisner Award for Best Comics-Related Item, Bone Figurine, Sculpted by Jeff Smith and Randy Bowen, 1996 Eisner Award for Best Title for Younger Readers, 1998 Eisner Award for Best Continuing Series, 1998 Eisner Award for Best Comics-Related Product, Bone Red Dragon Cold Cast Statue. Sculpted by Randy Bowen, based on designs by Jeff Smith. 1998 Eisner Award for Best Comics Publication for a Younger Audience, 1999 Eisner Award for Best Comics Related Product Item, Phony Bone Inflatable, 2003 Eisner Award for Best Graphic Album Reprint, Bone Volume 8, Treasure Hunters, 2004 Eisner Award for Best Writer Artist, Humor Jeff Smith. 2005 Eisner Award for Best Comics Publication for a Younger Audience, 2006 Eisner Award for Best Coloring, Steve Hamaker, Bone, The Great Cow Race, 2008 Eisner Award for Best Coloring, Steve Hamaker, Bone and Shazam, Monster Society of Evil. Other media. Equals film equals, in the late 1990s, an attempt was made through Nickelodeon movies to produce a film version of Bone. Jeff Smith said in a 2003 interview that Nickelodeon had insisted on the Bone Cousins being voiced by child actors, and wanted the film's soundtrack to include pop songs by the likes of NSYNC. Smith's response was that one would never insert pop songs in the middle of The Lord of the Rings or The Empire Strikes Back, and therefore pop songs should not be placed in Bone either. On March 9, 2008, Cinematical.com announced that Warner Brothers had bought the film rights to the series. Smith's website confirmed on March 13, 2008 that he had made a deal with Warner Brothers to adapt the Bone Saga into a film series. Further information was given in July 2011, citing, a third, 
Swift's script is currently in the works and will most likely yield three separate, computer-animated, 3D films. The first film was estimated to be released at the earliest in 2013. In January 2012, it was reported that Patrick Sean Smith, the creator of TV series Greek, was hired to write an adaptation, and that P.J. Hogan is attached to direct the feature, which will be produced by Lynn Pictures and Animal Logic. Equals action figures equals, in 1996 the toy manufacturer Resaurus released series one of a bone figure line, featuring, Phone Bone with Rat Cub, Thorn, Smiley Bone, and Rat Creature. Five years later, a second line was released with Grandma Ben, Phony Bone, The Hooded One, and a deluxe boxed set of King Duck. Two exclusive figures were released through the toy and comic magazine previews Hooded One, and Phony Bone as Ahab. Most recently, in 2007, Dark Horse Comics Presents released a 5-inch high statue of Phone Bone, which is limited to 750 pieces and to be sold through Wizard Magazine. Equals video games equals, on February 22, 2005, the video game company Telltale Games announced that they would be developing adventure games based on the comic using episodic format. The first episode, Bone, out from Bonneville, was released on September 15, 2005, and the second, The Great Cow Race, on April 12, 2006. Both are available in downloaded or boxed form on Telltale's website for Windows-based PCs. Currently, Telltale Games has suspended any further development of the Bone game series. There hasn't been another Bone-related video game ever since then. On October 13, 2006, video game company Vaughn Brio Entertainment announced the release of a Macintosh version of Bone Act 1, out of Bonneville. Equals novels equals, Bone. Legacy is a sequel trilogy of novels following the adventures of new bones in their quest in the valley. The first installment, Part 1, Quest for the Spark, was released on February 1, 2011. The second installment, Part 2, Quest for the Spark, was released on February 1, 2012. The third and final installment to the trilogy, Part 3, Quest for the Spark, was released on February 1, 2013. See also Indie Comics References External links, Bonneville.com, Official Bone Site, Welcome to Bonneville.com, Unofficial Bone Community Forum, Bone Cover Gallery, Bone Page at Toonopedia, Scholastic Kids Bone Website, Bone Adventure Game Official Site.